those of us raised in the church, the story is very familiar that uh, Jesus entered Jerusalem that last time before the cross. Time he would come in glory with that glorified body. Uh, bless God without spot or wrinkle. Amen. And uh, could walk through walls and yet they could touch him. Could eat fish and yet he was eternal. But now, this last time before the cross, the last time in this fully human body, he enters and we know the story. The crowd gathers and we have a parade. We just have a parade and we wave branches and are happy and we sing and that's the story. But a text without a context is pretext. We need to look not only at the story, but why the story? And, and so we're going to look at the text, but uh, I'm going to jump back and uh, look at some other texts that link in as well. Luke 19 at 28 following. After he had said this, pause. Well, what did he say? Well, really, you need to back up. I tried to make this as short as possible because even though this is Bible reading, y'all are going to count it against my preaching time. But I tried to make this short. You, you have to minimum back up to the beginning of this chapter 19, Zacchaeus. Y'all know Zacchaeus, wee little man, and a wee little man was he. And he climbed up in that sycamore tree. There you go. And uh, he was going to see Jesus. And some of y'all still singing that song. But anyway, that's okay. And the point is, the crowd considered him an outcast. The crowd considered him an outcast. But listen to what Jesus has to say. Uh, verse 9b, today salvation has come to this house. And they've gone home with Zacchaeus to eat. And, and, and it's from Zacchaeus' house that he says this. Today salvation has come to this house because he, Zacchaeus too, is a son of Abraham for the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. So what was Jesus' purpose? Seek, save. Two words, seek, save. You've got that as the purpose of Jesus. Verse 11, next verse. As they were listening to this, he went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem. You see, they're on their way for Palm Sunday. He was near Jerusalem, and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. And then he tells a parable. But he tells it because the timing is right. They're near Jerusalem, and there's this one idea that he has to correct before they enter the holy city. They think the kingdom of God is going to come immediately. And when they conceive the kingdom of God, as we will see, they're thinking of something they want. They're thinking, we're going to jumpstart a rebellion. We're going to name us our own king. Rome thinks they're in charge, but we're going to name our own king. And that king is going to kick out Rome and we're going to be the top dog. And so they wave the sign of the Davidic kingdom, the palm branch. Now, palm branches don't show up in Luke's gospel. You've got to flip over to John to find the palm branches. But they're there. And that's the symbol of David being king. And so they are saying to be king, he's going to be like David, only better. He's going to be a warrior. He is going to kick out those hated people. And because they supposed the kingdom of God was to appear immediately, he tells a parable. Now, I, I was taught the parable was called the parable of the ten minas. 
uh, modern translations will say 10 other measurements of money. 10 pounds is what the New Revised Standard calls it. But it's money. And what's happening here is that two parables we're familiar with in other places are joined together. A parable where they don't want this ruler. If they kill the one the ruler sends, they'll, they'll get to keep all the property themselves. And the parable of the talents, where, you know, the, the, the ruler gives out money and expects a return. And so those two things are com- combined into the parable of the minas. And in verse 15, when he had returned, having received royal power. Why does he receive royal power? Because they don't want him as king. They don't want him as the boss. But he comes in royal power. Now this is a story Jesus tells. He ordered these slaves to whom he had given the money to be summoned so that he might find out what they had gained by trading. Whatever else about the story, the story tells us that we're going to be held accountable at some point in the future for what we do with what God gives us. In the story, the money is given out in different measurements. Some get a lot, some get a little. But whatever the measurement is, what you do with what you have, you're expected to give a return on that. You're not held accountable for what God gave Earl. You're held accountable for what God gave you. And there will be an accounting one day, and that will be when he has received royal power. And so you have slaves call forth, and one makes 10 pounds more, and one makes 5 pounds more, and one guy hides his money in the cloth. Hear Jesus pronounce this. I tell you, to all those who have more will be given. More. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and slaughter them in my presence. Now this is gentle Jesus, meek and mild, talking about what he knows is going to be the last event on earth, the cross. And just to make sure they understand what this is about, he says, bring those enemies. There's going to be judgment. There will be judgment one day. Bring them here and slaughter them in my presence. After he said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. That's where we begin today, Abby. 28. You can't do it. Okay. I'll read it to you. After he said this, what did he say? Well, slaughter those people who didn't want me to be king. But also, uh, there will be an accounting of those who uh, are given something. You know, you better do something with what God gives you, or God will even take what little you have away from you. And even the outcast is welcome in the kingdom if they look to Jesus. After he said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. Pause there. Why do you go up to Jerusalem? Well, Jerusalem was physically set on a hill. However you approached the city, you went up. In the Psalms, you had Psalms of ascent. You were supposed to sing them going uphill. I always wondered how they could catch their breath. But anytime you went to visit the temple as you approached the holy city and as you walked up you would sing a song of ascent. And they also had in the Psalms songs of descent. Guess when you sang those? Going down. And so he went up going to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt who has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. Now, Lord there is what I translate as boss, kyrios. It's not a name. It's not, 
It's a title. Uh, the, the one in charge needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord Kyrios needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples. Now, who's talking? The disciples. The whole multitude. It's not just the twelve. You remember he's already sent out the seventy-two. There's a, there's a crowd, a good-sized crowd. I would take up an offering there, but that's just me. And there's a decent-sized crowd with him. And all of the multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King. I wonder who they're talking about. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Almost sounds like what the angel said when he was born. Peace, glory. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable or in the name of Jesus become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. Back in a previous century, I won't mention which one, but back in a previous century I was doing youth work and uh, the kids had a, had a song they loved to sing. It was a praise song, ain't no rock gonna cry in my place as long as I'm alive I glorify His holy name. Ain't no rock. And they'd sing it and joyfully just get everybody excited. And when the kids got excited the older people would get excited. And we just had a good time. But I'm going to tell you, it's a whole lot easier to join a parade than join a cross. It's one thing to sing. It's another to live it out. You've got a mixed message going on here. They're saying Jesus is king, but they want to define what that means. They want to have him overthrow Rome. They want to be free. Uh, they want the kingdom now. He's already warned them through parable that the kingdom is not yet. But they want what they want, unlike us. They want what they want, and they want freedom, and they want power. And so they have this parade, and, and the crowd joins the parade and proclaim him king now, if you would flip one page in my Bible over, you would find Dr. Luke telling the story of Jesus in front of Pilate. And the charge is placed against him by the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the Jews. And they say, this man is upsetting the nation. He is teaching our people not to pay taxes to Caesar. Now, why was Rome in Jerusalem in the first place? Money. And the strongest thing they can say against anybody is he wants to cut off the money. He's teaching. Now, that's a lie. He didn't teach the people not to pay taxes. Render unto Caesar that which belongs to Caesar. I'm reminding you tomorrow's April 15th. Render unto Caesar. <laughs> I went from preaching to meddling just that quick. Render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Render unto God that which belongs to God. That's what he taught. But now the Sanhedrin are telling Pilate, he tells us not to pay taxes. And they, he says he is a king and a savior, a messiah. Pilate knows better than that. 
he tells them that, you know, I don't find any evidence of the charges you're bringing against him. I'm going to just beat him up real good, scourge him, and let him go. And they continue pressuring him, and he gives in. He caves. He's a coward. And crucifies him. And orders a sign to be erected above the cross. King of the Jews. The Jews don't want that. The, the, the ruling party, no, he don't say he's king, say he says he's king. And Pilate, what I've written, I have written. What he's saying there is that this is what happens to anybody that raises themselves up in power against Rome. We crucify kings. Only two categories of people were crucified. Runaway slaves and those who wanted to overthrow the government, insurrectionists, because it had to do with money. Their whole economy is based on slavery. And if a slave runs, in, in effect, they thought of that as theft of property. And if you overthrow the government, well, how are we going to make money? And so they painfully and publicly and as long as possible executed those that fell under that category. And Jesus was killed because his crime, they said, was insurrectionist. But he comes on a donkey, not on a stallion. Symbol of peace. Symbol of humility. And it's not even his own donkey. It's borrowed. Like the donkey was borrowed when Mary went to Bethlehem. How do I know they didn't own the donkey? They were poor. Luke 2, they go to make sacrifice in the temple for the firstborn male child. And Luke makes it very clear that they offer the sacrifice two doves or two turtle dove, uh, two pigeons or two turtle doves. And if you go back and check Leviticus, that's the offering of the poor. Because you were supposed to offer a lamb, but if you couldn't afford one, they were poor. And on a borrowed animal, he comes and he proclaims peace. But the crowd says, King! And Jesus has told them, seek and save the lost. Kingdom, not yet. You will be required to give a response for what you did with what God gives you. And the day will come, you will be judged by looking at me as an authority. But the crowd shouts, and it's easy to join a parade. One more verse I would add. I finished with, I tell you, if these stones were, if, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, if you even you had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace. What were those things that make for peace? Well, he comes on the donkey, and he comes to bring salvation. He comes to bring peace. And if you had only recognized that, but now they are hidden from your eyes. It's a mixed message. The people want a king and Jesus wants to be our Savior. He wants to usher in God's kingdom. And we still miss that message when we try to define who Jesus is. Anybody here been to a football game in Decatur County? Anybody? Come on, you can confess. I'm told, now I haven't been here the whole time, so I don't know. 
But I'm told the oldest ritual of entry for any athletic event in West Tennessee happens at Decatur County when the boys run in. Now, I haven't been here all that long, but I've seen it done. And the boys come in, and what happens? The crowd goes crazy. They, they process by in the stadium, and then they go down to the infield and run out under the goalpost, and everybody cheers. And what are we trying to do? Well, yeah, we're trying to encourage the boys, but we're also trying, come on, this is church. You can tell the truth here. We're trying to intimidate. We're trying to proclaim power. We're saying we're stronger than you are. We're trying to scare. And Jesus comes instead on a donkey. Now, I've been asked, preacher, are there animals in heaven? My response is there's at least one, a white horse. He's, he's coming. And the day will come, he will come in power and majesty. And if you think that football game is something, you ought to see this event. But for now, for now, you receive him as he presents himself lowly, humble, on a donkey. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen.